Welcome to Money Talks. I'm Genevieve Westcott with the latest financial news from across New Zealand and around the globe. In this edition, a first-hand report on the emerging Asian economies. ASB rural economist James Shortle shares his expert insights fresh off a flight from Cambodia. India woos our dairy companies for their leading-edge technology as a sweetener to a free trade agreement with New Zealand. Who wins? Who loses? And Fonterra does the deal and acquires rural supplies chain RD1. All this and much, much more coming up. But first, here to tell us about the latest market developments and rural commodity news from around the globe is ASB Rural Economist James Shortle. James, you've been on holiday. Great to have you back. Oh, it's good to be back. I would say that, but, you know, I have been enjoying 35 degrees, so it's a bit cold back here in New Zealand now. We're going to talk about that uh, in part two, but let's go right to the markets now. What's happening around the globe? Well, I think over the uh, coming back, it's been quite surprising, actually, to see, uh, you know, that mo- most of the focus has been on Greece and even um, sitting in a hotel room in Cambodia, then it was interesting to see, you know, the the uh, the riots and that sort of thing that were happening because of the austerity measures and the, and the changes that, that need to need to happen. So Greece has been the focus. And I mean, it's, I think it's actually, you know, it's concerning to see this continuing to go on. The US also um, is going through their issues. And, you know, we're coming up three years after the, the global financial crisis. So, yeah. The New Zealand dollar has been trading at its all time highs. Uh, uh, what can we expect moving forward? Well, I think the Kiwi dollar is going to continue to strengthen. I mean, the, the reason we did see it trade up well over 83 cents to an, another post float high last week. Uh, you know, we did see uh, Greece come back into, they, they sorted things out, and um, that was seen to be good news for the market. So, Kiwi dollar was, uh, w- you know, was pretty hot buying, um, but I also think that the Kiwi is, is going to continue to strengthen. We, we're actually picking that it could go up to 85 cents uh, later on this year and even over the next 12 months. Um, it's really not uh, going to drop too much below uh, 80 cents. So it's probably going to average around um, well over 80 cents. It could drop, you know, over every couple of days, but not too much. Okay, let's talk white gold, uh, global dairy trade auction overnight, and it drops 6.7%. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I'm not surprised because we have seen uh, agriculture commodities around the world fall, you know, quite significantly over the past four weeks. Wheat prices out of the U.S. down 25 percent. Yeah, uh, what's behind that? Yeah, well, I think the, some of the uh, the more recent climatic changes, you know, the, the the market has been probably a little bit oversold, got a li- little bit too high on the expectation that pro- uh, production is going to be lower this year. But now all of a sudden, the uh, you know things are looking a little bit better. Production could be around where they were expecting it to be earlier on in the year. So the market's just reacted and uh, and dropped quite significantly. So I think um, you know it's probably going to be somewhere in between those two. But you know the dairy prices, you know it, it probably is is reflected a little bit in, in what's happening around the world. Um, but when you do look at it in context, um, whole milk powder, for instance, down 25 percent just over the last four or five months. So that is a little bit concerning. And with grain prices now uh, heading downwards, what kind of effect on livestock producers, for example? Well, it's good news for livestock producers, which is a which is a worry for us here. In New Zealand, of course, uh, you know, US milk production has been increasing over the past year to 18 months, um, and that's been happening even though uh, grain prices have been high. So the fact that grain prices are going to drop um, is going to provide incentive for, uh, for for dairy producers just to produce a bit more milk while milk prices are looking pretty good. So, uh, you know, that, that could be a bit of a concern uh, down the track. And US beef markets, of course, looking pretty edgy. Prices are still looking good. Uh, I can't, you know, we can't forget that, that the, the US imported beef price is still very, very strong, still much higher than it was last year. But I think demand really has dropped off, and we did see some evidence of that over the past week. Um, the, the U.S. Department of Agriculture released reports on uh, on cold storage and that sort of thing, and product in storage has risen, which to me indicates that people aren't buying as much. Interesting that cotton prices continue to go down, but wool's holding its own. Oh, no, I know. I, I, I figure I, that out. I, I, Come I can't on, what's the reason? Explain that, to be honest. <laughs> other than um, you know, I think later on this year when we da- do start to see uh, some of those prices really hitting the market, we could see a bit of a reaction. Um, Of course, cotton prices have dropped quite a bit and even looking forward to the futures market, um, looking to December, then they're they're looking like they could even drop further. So um, it's it's an interesting dynamic and, um, you know, we've got consumers out there that are hurting. Commodity prices now have fallen for the first time in 10 months. Is, Is this the end of the golden weather for our exports? Well, I don't know that, that it is. Uh, you know, we've seen commodity prices rise um, extremely high, and and things have been looking looking good. So um, I think they may have just may, may have just capped out a little bit. I'm not picking that they that they're going to drop significantly, but um, you know, perhaps the gains that we have seen have been have been maxed out to some extent. Thanks, James. More on Greece and the U.S. economy, and a lot more when we come back. Coming up after the break. 
two of the country's biggest exporters team up to cut costs. Fonterra and Silver Fern Farms boost their shipping services. New rules for financial advisors aimed at protecting gullible consumers. How's that working out? We asked Spicer senior man Jeff Matthews. And our roving economist's world-famous close-up and personal eyewitness account of life in Cambodia today, complete with holiday snaps. Really? Why Phnom Penh is a capital success story these days. So as we head to break just for fun, answer this in our Farmers Facts and Figures quiz. What percentage of Cambodians work in agriculture? Find out when we return. Stay with us. Welcome back to Money Talks. Just before the break, we asked you, what percentage of Cambodians work in agriculture? 60% work on the land, with half of the country under the age of 25. Joining us now is senior financial advisor Jeff Matthews of Spicers. And Jeff, let's start here at home. Tough new rules, of course, for financial uh, advisors like yourself brought in by the government to protect consumers. Where's it at? 1st of July, the Financial Markets Authority took over. Um, originally, they thought there might be four, four and a half thousand people who became AFAs, that's Authorised Financial Advisors. There's 1,609 as of the 1st of July who are qualified to give advice. The way it splits it up now is there is level one advice and kind of level two. So level one is comprehensive advice that I would give. I can also give advice on KiwiSaver and a whole range of investments. If you're a level two advisor, you can only do basic insurance, term deposits, and pretty much that's all you can give advice on. So a lot of people in the banks would, would be that level. How much is this really going to help out, you know, all the ordinary people out there, if you like, uh, being protected from unscrupulous operators? What you have to do is rebuild confidence. Uh, I mean, okay, the horse is bolted, people made bad investment decisions with finance companies, is. And to some extent, we're starting to see, we've seen one successful case against an advisor a couple of weeks ago about giving poor advice. There are other cases pending. There are cases pending against the trustees of the finance companies. So we're trying to tidy up what's what's happened. Um, but going forward, I mean, up until two weeks ago, I mean, you could have called yourself a financial advisor. Yeah, know. it's shocking. It, it's, it's absolutely you know, shocking. So, and it, I mean, in our office, we're pretty well structured, but even us, we're, we're struggling with the amount of paperwork for disclosures um, that clients, you know, have to receive. Gentlemen, the New Zealand economy, uh, their latest reports out from New Zealand Institute of Economic uh, Research says that the economy is doing better, but we're still at risk. James. Well, we're gonna, tomorrow we're going to have uh, GDP numbers out and, you know, I think it's going to probably show a, a bit of an increase in economic activity, but nothing to get too excited about. And, uh, you know, considering what we've, what's happened and what's happening in the economy, then that's not really surprising. And looking across the ditch, of course, James, we see that the Australian economy continues to slow down. Uh, uh, what are your fears when you look at that situation? Yeah, well, so yesterday um, they released their, the, the Reserve Bank of Australia uh, provided their overnight cash rate. They left it unchanged, and their central bank governor was actually a little bit more uh, markets, they call it dovish, so that means that they are a bit more pessimistic about what, how things are going. And, you know, they've, they've you know, been through a bit of a tough time. They've had climatic issues, weather issues, um, consumers are still feeling the pinch. I mean, the resource industry's been going really well, but, you know, they're, they're not in uh, tip-top shape either, I guess. John Key, of course, is uh, right back from India. He's been chasing for four days a free trade agreement uh, with what is, without a doubt, a superpower. But they apparently want to tap into our uh, state-of-the-art Derek technology. Uh, what do you make of that, Jeff? It'll be interesting to see how Fonterra deals with, with India. I mean, it, I mean, cows are a religi religious thing in, in, in India, so... Our farming techniques may not go down particularly well in some parts of India. And, and India is afraid, of course, that uh, it's going to reduce uh, their tariffs of our products going in too quickly. Uh, are they right to be concerned, James? Hopefully. I mean, that would be a great <laughs> thing for us, to be honest. I mean, the, the, India is a huge, a huge market. It's growing rapidly. The good thing for us, they already uh, eat they, uh, dairy. They're the largest dairy producers in the world. Um, so, you know, little old New Zealand a bit of product in there, I can't see it's um, going to be a major issue. It'll be but a blip, really. I mean. it, it will be a blip, but um, I think there's an opportunity for us to to put high value products in there for yeah. you know uh, for the for the growing for the growing markets, and that would be fantastic for us. Talking about Fonterra for the first time, they've issued Australian bonds. Tell me more. Yes, it's really interesting. I mean, they've obviously seen they've been issuing some bonds. I mean, in China last last couple of weeks, Australia um, uh, just over the past week. 
And they're actually, the reason they're doing this is they're, they're, getting, they're getting really good rates. I mean, they're getting rates that are, um, are lower than the banks in some cases. And, and I mean, that's, it's, I mean, it's a good thing for Fonterra. And, uh, you know, I guess investors are looking to diversify a little bit away from banks, wanting to get a little bit into some other companies. And Jeff, what does this say about the international investors' view of New Zealand? Given the fact that things look, you know, pretty sick in, in Europe at the moment, um, you know, what we tend to do is we get we get lumped in with Australia. So we're in the commodity boom. We're at, you know, the, the, the best position we've been in in years. Um, they view us as a safe risk. We always pay our debts. I mean, no one's ever defaulted in New Zealand, not even a local government. I mean, so looking around the world, we look a relatively low risk place to park a little bit of cash. One of the interesting things is that the Australian uh, pension fund is massive and uh, mm -hmm. looking at the numbers that are coming through, they're going to have one, the fourth largest pension fund in the world over the next sort of uh, 20 years yep. um, and they need, they need to put, put money somewhere and it's something that we haven't been able to do. We always talk about our savings rates, KiwiSavers changing, um, look what happens when you've got a big bucket of money and you need to put it somewhere. fonterra has been very busy. They've also taken total control now of RD1. Well, I suppose that's good, 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 yeah. good for farmers. They might be able to get some benefits out of that, uh, you know, and I guess they're taking advantage of, of, of some of the situations and acquisitions that have been happening around the world, I guess, um, you know, reshuffling up the carts. And they've teamed up uh, with Silver Fern Farms, Fonterra, and they're going to set up a new kind of a shipping company. Uh, uh, shouldn't they stick to their knitting? Well, why not? I mean, they're probably shipping to the same places. It's a good way to save money um, and for our agriculture industry to, to piggyback off each other. I mean, it sounds, sounds like a, a good sense to the me. The shipping market's a tough market, so if you can you know, gang up with somebody else to beat them down on price, you should do. Yeah, we are a very small country at, at, uh, far, far away from the rest of the world. Yeah, and I mean, we've had, to, had issues uh, getting ships down here, getting ships out, um, depending on, on um, time frames and things like that. So, you know, this might give them yeah. a little bit more market power out there. So it's a good thing. I can't wait any longer. You are just back from Cambodia. Uh, how was it? What were your impressions? Uh, tell us what's going on there. Oh, it's a fantastic place. I, I went over with, um, with you know, really no expectations about what to expect and, uh, you know, it just exceeded them in all, in all areas. I mean, it's got a, a troubled past of the last sort of 50 years, um, of course, with the Khmer Rouge uh, regime um, and civil war um, unrest, that sort of thing. But if you look back, looking at some of the, the temples, Angkor Wat, just unbelievable, and, and the whole Angkor region, um, you know, they've got a rich history sort of dating back to the 8th to the 14th century. So it's a, it's a really interesting interesting country to go to, um, great people, great food, cheap to travel to. It's on the early stages of its economic development, so it was fantastic for me to see. And as an, as an emerging Asian economy, how do you think they're doing? Apparently in the past five years, uh, it's, there's been phenomenal, almost explosive growth there. Yeah, I mean, when you look at um, how they're comparing, I mean, they're, they're right up there with their, their economic growth is right up there with China. But, um, you know, riding around on a little tuk-tuk uh, in Phnom Penh, which is a capital city, then you, you still see just the, the, the poor the poor people, the markets, the, the um, you know, there's still a lot of issues. You know, they're very, very, very poor in a lot of ways. Um, but they are rapidly, rapidly growing, and but it's, it's, it's they're probably uh, just at the early, early stages of how on their phase of economic growth. It's going to be another 30 to 40 years before yeah. they get there, but um, it's exciting. From 2004 to 2007, I was reading that their economy increased by 10% a year. Uh, do you think they can keep that up? Oh, definitely. I mean, the the, the building. Um, you know, looking at some of the some of the some of the stats, and they had virtually no buildings over sort of mm. five six stories. All of a sudden, now they've got you know 60, 70 buildings. There's consents for another 200. Um, you know, we talk about uh, a construction boom happening out of Christchurch. I mean, look at a capital city like that. It's phenomenal. Um, but uh, you know, their their manufacturing industries. Uh, you see people, you know, going past some of the garment factories. Um, people just pouring out of these out of these things, sitting in their little um, sewing machines and that sort of thing. It's it's uh, it's just fascinating. Now they're clear. Sorry, sorry, those would have been jobs that would have been done in China or quite often. You know, up until a couple of years ago, and China's slowly kind of pricing itself off the market and the garment industry. I mean, one is the, the, raise, the wages are rising quite fast in, in China and also the currency is rising, which makes it, you know, uncompetitive. So Vietnam, K 
Cambodia, Laos, they're all the next kind of places to get some growth. Yeah, well, you, and you kind of look at some of those, um, you, you feel bad about buying uh, you know, clothing. I mean, all the big, the big companies, the, the Gaps, the Pumas, the, the <coughs> Nikes, you know, they're all using uh, factories out of, out of uh, Cambodia, out of Phnom Penh. Um, so you feel bad about, you know, workers working for a dollar a day, that sort of thing, which, you know, it's, it, is really not acceptable. But at the same time, it's, uh, I see it uh, in some ways a little bit like a share milker here. They, they, they do the time. Um, Get, you know, building up their equity, building up their money, then they move to the next, yeah. you know, a, a, a small farm, then they move to the big farm. It's the same as Cambodia. They're, they're, they're sticking to their knitting with the manufacturing sector. China's now going into building Highland. ships and yeah. cars, <coughs> all sorts of stuff, and, and they'll move on from there. It's just the same as how the economy works. It was great to see New Zealand lamb on the menu in Cambodia. Tell me about that, and tell me about the processing chain you saw, because we're going <laughs> to we're going to share that with the viewers. Yeah, well, um, going through some of the markets, it's just you know you've got like hygiene standards just don't exist and uh, you know food stalls that sort of thing women walking around with um, you know people coming out at night people a lot of people eating on the sides of streets just out of food stalls uh, in the markets you know just meat just lying on the on the ground and, and no refrigeration stinks um, that is gutting things there there's fish there's everything sort of mixed in so nobody really <laughs> cares too much about that um, and and looking at some of the uh, that you know I went to the the uh, the FCC club which is a, the foreign foreign course course Correspondence Club, yes. Yeah, which is a very a big tourist spot in Phnom Penh, but it's where a lot of the journalists used to hang out during the uh, during the Civil War and that sort of thing. So, of course, we went there, had a had an ale um, and uh, had a meal also, and New Zealand lamb was on the menu. It's looking pretty cheap, to be honest. Um, <laughs> yeah. A lot of Australian beef on the on the on the uh, on the menus uh, there too. So, um, no, it's, it, it was very very interesting. A agricultural industry is. Uh, is, is interesting too. Looking at some of their um, some of the articles, then water is a major, major, um, a major thing for them. Of course, they get there right now. It's a monsoon season, so um, bucketing down with rain, but uh, it gets very, very dry the rest of the year. So they need to conserve water in order to um, grow their crops. Yeah. From Cambodia, where things are going very, very well, to Greece, where things are still pretty edgy. What's the latest, Jeff? There's a, <coughs> basically a bridging loan uh, that the European Central Bank and the IMF are organising because Greece has a number of bonds that fall due at the end of this month and without some extra finance they default on them. It's just again it's a short term fix. Greece basically is an uncompetitive economy. It's got too much debt and so the idea that you can extend the loan or change the interest rate, that technically is a default. I mean, You can't mention the D word, they, they all kind of go paranoid. The logical thing would be for the bondholders to extend the bonds out a longer period of time and take what's known as a haircut, and basically you, you're rolling over existing bonds, and you, you but you only get 70, 70 cents on the dollar back, and you agree to lend for a longer period. That would take some of the heat off, and then with asset sales, um, you know maybe they can kickstart their economy. If you look next door to Greece, Turkey is growing at 11 percent this year faster now this than China. is interesting yes but 10 years ago they were in the same situation they had inflation at 70 percent they had the IMF all over the all over the Turkish government telling them how to run the economy they went through a recession they had a major devaluation and at Turk is booming. A client of mine sent me an article the other day. I mean, consumer credit's up 25%. They're the fourth largest shipbuilder in the world now. Um, things are booming in, in Turkey at the moment. And how, so, how, how did but, they turn it around? Well, the, the problem for Greece is what you if you were a standalone, you'd basically devalue 25, 30%. Suddenly you're competitive. Your exports are able to pick up. You cut back on imports, but they're locked in a straitjacket because they're stuck in the euro. And that's part of their problem, is they can't devalue their way out of their situation and become competitive. It's going to be a long, hard grind. Meantime, over in the United States, uh, things are still very, very dodgy there. Uh, where are we sitting now? Well, I mean, in my opinion, um, yeah, there's, there's some <coughs> underlying issues. Over the, over the past week, there's been a few economic reports that have been more positive, manufacturing data, that sort of thing that's looking a bit better. But, um, you know, the US has got some fairly sizable issues that I think, you know, all these things building out, they're simmering away, um, potentially over the next couple of years, it's, it's going to have an impact and they're going to really come home to roost. And that's, that is concerning, something to watch out for. I mean, US, U.S. consumers have basically paid off about a trillion dollars worth of debt in the last two years. So a lot of household finances have it. You know, the hit happened three years ago. They've been paying down credit card debt, paying down mortgage debt. They're actually getting themselves back into a better position. I, I saw the other day that 
there are more and more people with high credit scores. Basically, 850 is the fastest, is the highest level you can have. And nowadays, more and more people are getting high credit scores, and they're able to go out and get finance. So that's the something that wasn't happening a year ago. So unfortunately, two juggernaut uh, economies, uh, uh, in, certainly in terms of how we're impacted around the world, Greece and the U.S. continue to be major concerns. Correct? Yeah, they're definitely. bubbling away in the background, but you know. The U.S. market's up 5% in the last week. Um, you've had $1.4 trillion worth of takeovers and mergers, and U.S. companies are sitting on about $1.7 trillion of cash. Once they start putting that out in the market to either buy other businesses or buy plant and machinery, you'll see a pickup in employment. So it's not all doom and gloom. Okay, I'm going to sleep better tonight. Thanks, Thank gentlemen. You. Coming up after the break, Future Proof. Head along for the ride as our experts hit the road and tell us what they'll be tracking over the next seven days. But first, a question for you in our Farmers Facts and Figures quiz. What percentage does agriculture contribute to Cambodia's GDP? The answer when we come back. Stay with us. Welcome back to Money Talks. Just before the break, we asked you, what percentage does agriculture contribute to Cambodia's GDP? Agriculture produces 33% of the country's GDP. And now it's time for Future Proof. What's coming up for our experts? Jeff, you've just been over in Noosa and you have some uh, not so good news. Well, you hear about the success story, the streets are paved in gold in Australia. That's only the commodity side. There's a lot of other parts of the economy that are doing it tough, and retailers are doing it tough, the education system, farming, manufacturing are all doing it tough in Australia with an exchange rate at a dollar eight against the US. So down in Noosa the other week, a lot of, a lot of shops have closed on the main, main shopping street, and um, all the women's, according to my wife, um, <laughs> all, the, all the women's high-end shoe and clothing stores all got 50% sales. They're all struggling. You're telling me you weren't in there checking it I out wasn't. firsthand no, as a financial I, I, guy? I get, the, I get the credit card bill. That's as far as I can. Oh, and that's the way it should be. Yeah, yeah. Uh, your thoughts on that on the Australian com uh, economy? Because, you know, little New Zealand always feels they're doing so much better than us. <clears throat> Yeah, well, I mean, they've had their had their problems too. I mean, for major floods and storms yep. uh, through the early part of the year. I mean, we've had our earthquakes, um, and uh, that's had, having a big issue on them, especially in, in Queensland and, and a lot of other areas. Uh, they've got, they sort of have long term impacts. People's houses being destroyed, and and it knocks their confidence. So, um, you know, they've they've got their, they've got a few problems, and they've they had a big surge out of it, uh, but now just tapering off, and that's probably, you know, what we've seen around the world, the US, I mean, things were looking quite good initially, and then they've just tapered off a little bit, um, and a lot of, you know, Europe and that sort of thing too. It's just going to be a long haul, long haul out of this. Hey guys, I wanted to ask you too about the latest news from Labour's Phil Goff, who's now, of course, running for election. He wants to bring in a capital gains tax, apparently, this is what we're hearing. Uh, what's your take on that? Another interesting call. I, I, it's, uh, I suspect, um, I mean, it's not going to go down very well with a lot of people. Um, yeah, are you going to put up your hand and say, <laughs> I'll be voting for more taxes, thank you. Yeah, I mean, if, uh, I mean, New Zealand, New Zealand's in a difficult position, I guess, um, in a lot of ways. You've got to look at uh, innovative ways to uh, uh, to get more revenue in, to repay some of our debt, to give us, get us out of um, some of our problems. But um, whether or not that's a capital gains tax is, a, is, a, is another question. What do you think, Jeff? It's one of the ones that IMF and other people have always said this, the one part of the economy that's missing because, <clears throat> you know, we overinvest in residential property because there's been huge tax advantages. Um, you either, if you don't have a capital gains tax, then basically, you know, you, you don't get the tax write off to offset against your other income in the story. The people in middle income are basically subsidising, uh, have been subsidising property investors for years. Uh, yeah, and, and critics would say that we've really priced housing right out of the market for the next generation yeah. coming up. How on earth are they going to afford it? So, in a sense, it might have some merit. Well, I mean, there's a lot of a lot of countries around the world that have capital gains taxes. Yep. Um, Australia, yeah. I mean, the US uh, on shares, Canada. on the whole, on the whole lot. So, um, it's not a it's not a new concept, I guess. Um, it's just something that's a bit new to New Zealand. So, uh, anything else? It's not else? an election winner. I have to say that. It's not an election winner. But it's, it's at least, you know, he's had the balls to raise it. I mean, I think that... that yeah, was but good. does he have a death wish? Well. I mean, really. What's the guy thinking? And also bringing in ETS early, a couple of years early. No. Uh, he's not going to be making friends among the farmers, I would Definitely think. Definitely not. 
There are two, there are two issues that are pretty, uh, very, very, um, uh, you know, sore points, I guess, with farmers. Um, you know, capital gains tax and the emissions trading scheme. So, um, very, that's probably obviously not a target market. I mean, right. I'm not anti-farming, but if you bought a farm for a couple of million and then a few years later it sells for five, you don't pay any tax. It's like the people, you know, great, great news for Charlie's. Well, I was going to say, you know, they don't get taxed. No, exactly. uh, they don't get taxed on their profits. So, we, but we want we want people to grow capital, but you know, it can't be subsidised by the you know kind of middle income families. There has to be. A, be a better tax collection system. Yeah, a debate that will have to be sorted out at some point uh, sooner rather than later, I suspect. Gentlemen, thank you so much. Always great to see you on the show. Thanks to my guests, James Shortle and Jeff Matthews. We love to hear your feedback, so be sure to check out the website. Meantime, if you sometimes struggle to get the attention of your farm hands or your farm animals for that matter, you might want to check out this show-stopping technique. Keep the faith. See you next time.